What are we talking about today, guys? <laughs> Case managers. Yeah. Bauer. 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 It's like a five-year-old pronouncing Bowser. <laughs> I wanted to call it Bowser, but um, a name had been taken. This episode is sponsored by Component One, make- makers of Widgmo. If you need stunning UI elements or awesome graphs and charts, then go to Widgmo.com and check them out. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 29 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from Earth. We also have Jameson Dance. Hi. Joe Eames. Howdy. Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. That's me. And this week, we have two special guests. We have... Uh, Alex McCaw, is that how you say it? That's right, good morning. And we have <laughs> Jacob Thornton. Oh yeah, uh, hey, how's it going? Is it, it Thornton? Did I say it yeah. wrong? killed it, you did it perfect. Okay. You just say fat, that's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Where does Probably that name come from? Um, I don't know. It comes from yeah, yo, 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 planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, planet Earth. So uh, anyway, this week we're going to be talking about Bower, which is, uh, if it, you can correct me at any time, it is a package manager for browser libraries, and it includes some kind of build mechanism or build package mechanism thing? Uh, not quite. So Bower is really, I guess the idea for Bower is to be like a slightly lower level than most package managers, and it's trying not to do any build stuff. So it just installs and resolves dependencies, and then it provides like an API that build tools can consume. So oh, okay. it's really it's really meant just to be like a like something that's relied on by like your build stack to install dependencies, and then it, your build stack is supposed to do the like different transport build stuff. Right, and it runs in Node, which means you install it with npm, right? Uh, yeah, you can do that, yeah. So, I, I thought it was kind of funny that you install a package manager with a package manager. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty meta. <laughs> so, so uh, this is a Twitter project, isn't it? Did I see? Did I read that wrong? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, sir. And uh, can you want to tell us a little bit about how it got started? Sure. I guess it started really back in at South by Southwest. Uh, a few of us were sitting around this table with, uh, let's see, a few beers. It was like Alex, uh, Tom Dale, Paul Irish, a handful of other people. And we were kind of arguing about package managers. So at the time, like I had written this thing called Ender. Um, Tom and Yehuda had written BPM. Um, Alex had been working on some weird thing that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> uh, ham or something, is that right? That is correct, yes. Oh, look, at, you see that? This is pure love, I remember that. Um, and so we all had these like real like crazy opinions. Like Tom was like, oh, it's got to be written, written in Ruby, because he likes all about the Rubies. And uh, Alex was like, oh, no, it's got to be written in CoffeeScript or JavaScript, because it's for the browser. And I was like, no, guys, it's got to be written in C. So this is so fast, and everyone thought I was the craziest, but that's fine. <laughs> and... But we had this like real interesting discussion going for a while, and I think we had a lot of interesting ideas, particularly around kind of like common problems that we had like all run into with our like respective attempts at trying to solve the package management um, problem, I guess, for the front end. And so, about I don't know, a few months went by, and uh, this thing like I was thinking about it all the time. It was like really dr- kind of driving me crazy. Um, and then uh, my manager Dan Webb who's this internet nerd that you guys might know about. He's a real good guy. Uh, convinced him that uh, it would be a really good idea if Twitter invested in a package management uh, tool and like started moving the front-end architecture towards one like this because we, for example, had like four or five different tweet boxes in production and all these different things, which would be you know solved by having something like a package manager that you could really publish and... Like, consume packages in like a consistent way across the company um and so yeah uh and i gotta like bring alex out of the revenue team um to help work on it i guess and then we did and that's kind of how it started and then we we did a lot of we spent a lot of time more than any project i've ever kind of seen or heard about really on the front end we like we spent so much time like 
going around and talking to people that are way smarter than us and getting their opinions on what they wanted or if they were in this space, like how they've done things or how they do things differently. So it was really cool. We kind of started out with a Google Doc that had just like tons and tons of people on it, just kind of commenting and like sharing ideas. And I think it worked really well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like how it started. And then we just wrote it. And right now it's being integrated into the Twitter stack by uh, this super smart, amazing guy, Angus Kroll. Um, and that's all going really well. Cool. Yeah. So it's that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little bit curious about what what problem it solves because I mean it's it's it is definitely more convenient than say going out to the website for each library you need and downloading it from them. But I mean, other than that, it may be dependency resolution. Are there are there other benefits to this approach? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's crazy. The people are actually managing JavaScript dependencies manually. Like we don't do that for any other language. So why you know why are we satisfied with that for JavaScript? Um, and so yes, it will satisfy dependencies for you. Um, it'll go out and fetch them and download them for you. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that as soon as you've got a, a package manager, then a lot of people start thinking in terms of small components. And so you get a lot of like smaller modular libraries being released rather than these rather big JavaScript libraries that we see at the moment. Interesting. Okay. Do you see this being integrated into other frameworks, like back-end frameworks, like some of the PHP frameworks or Ruby on Rails or anything like that? to manage some of the dependencies as opposed to um, and, and some of the other ways that they use to get those JavaScript packages into their package management or, you know, public folders or whatever? Yeah. Um, we've been working with uh, the Rails core team and Sprockets um, and getting some integration there. Yeah. Um, you just made also, me happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeoman uh, is a tool which uh, Paul and those guys are working on, and it's integrated in that. Um I don't think it's going to be integrated into what is the what's the popular node one Browserify. Talked with that guy a little bit or with uh, Substack, and he was didn't seem real thrilled <laughs> about, about. I was going to ask about that. How is yeah. it different from stuff like Browserify or Ender? Uh, uh, yeah, its main difference is well, it's really different from Browserify. Um, it's different from Ender in a few fundamental ways. So uh, Ender. Ender is really all about kind of trying to install packages around like the CommonJS transport and like building them into a way that you can require them, like from the browser doing like var x equals require, you know, my library x or whatever. Um, but uh, Bower is not really trying to do that, right? It's just it's just installing dependencies around versions, and then it provides this API for your build tools to consume, and like you get to choose how you kind of consume them. Um, so, Which so the, really one important. one of the things we wanted to move away from was npm, um, and Fat was uh, Jacob was um, sort of burnt by npm with Ember, and I think I was as well, because there are a lot of um, packages in npm which are node packages, um, and it's good to actually I think separate out the node packages and the browser packages, and so we needed like a separate repository. Oh yeah, definitely. So we also it's, have a very different like uh, install, um, I guess, philosophy. So Ender uses npm to install things, and npm has this like way of resolving dependencies, which is kind of each each package you depend on gets its own like kind of tree of dependencies. And so if I installed three different like jQuery plugins, for example, each one could depend on its own version of jQuery, and so you'd end up with three different versions of jQuery installed and like bundled into your uh, your app, which for the front end is not awesome <laughs> at all. And so that was something that we really wanted to avoid uh, with Bower. And so you can actually it actually like tries to use the same one, and then it'll like uh, throw warnings and errors and other types of things to like kind of let you know when things conflict or versions aren't satisfied and things like that. But the dependencies are like shared within a project and flat as opposed to nested, if that makes sense. So you don't have like trees of dependencies. You just no. each project kind of installs tries to use installed dependencies and if they're not installed, it installs them? It installs them, yeah, but it installs it in like a flat way. So sure. the first package will install jQuery and it'll look at the versions and then it'll look at the second package. And if that one it'll like 
continue to try to like fix the versions the best it can to get like satisfy all the projects. And if it can't satisfy the version for like all the requirements, which is very like we haven't run into yet, if it is the case, it'll like throw an error and be like, hey, like you need to like deal with this. Right. So, um, are, are there any folks out there using it right now? I know you said it's being um, integrated into Twitter's technology stack. Are, are there other folks that you know that are already using this? I have my suspicions that GitHub is working on integrating it just because of Josh's involvement. I don't know if that's true or not. He seems to have been playing with it a lot. And But it's only about a, like a week old, I'd say. So um, there's... It was it's pretty crazy. I mean, we've gotten a lot of really good response. Like, um, I think within the first week, we've got more kind of stargazers or whatever they're called now than any <laughs> other front end package. But but I I haven't heard of anyone that's specifically like, oh yeah, like we've moved our entire infrastructure on top of this yet. I know um, Google are looking at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google's definitely looking at it. So uh, again, the Yeoman project is using it. So yeah. So it, it seems like lots of the other package managers are more opinionated on what transport mechanism and what requires style you use. Like you said, with Ender, you you use common JS, and same with Browserify. There's Jam that kind of makes you use require JS, and it looks like you deliberately didn't really specify anything like that. It's just to install stuff, and then the way you actually use that code in your app is pretty much up to you, right? Right, exactly. So. Uh, we were like, I kind of, I feel like uh, transports in a lot of ways, while I understand they're trying to solve like problems because they're solving really similar problems in really different ways, like it's kind of ended up almost like segmenting the community more more than it probably should have. Um, and so I think with with Bauer, we're, we saw a real common, like a common problem across all the different transports, and so we were trying to think of a way to solve it without, like, further segmenting the community, which I think is something that other package managers, like, haven't really been able to do. Um, and so, yeah, this is our kind of way of trying to do that. Yeah, we also wanted to ensure that you didn't have to edit a library if you wanted to include it in the Bauer repository. And that was like a key requirement. Because there's a lot of jQuery plugins and things that um, just aren't going to support common JS. Yeah, for sure. Right. So when you're talking about transports, what exactly are you talking about? I'm not sure I completely follow what what you were just going over. Oh, um, so you could say common common JS. So like requires regular require style is one, or you could say um, AMD is one, or like the require. Oh, okay. Uh, JS styles one, just regular script tags and like augmenting global objects is one kind of um, just different ways of kind of importing like right. code into your code base. I guess that's what I meant. Okay, that makes sense. So yeah. if you want, if you want to add a package to uh, Bower, how how do you go about doing that? Uh, it's basically like a URL shortener, um, and so it's first come first served. There's no authentication or anything. You just say, you put your package up on GitHub or some Git repository. Um, then you go to the, the command line, you say Bower, um, uh, Bower add, and then you the name of the repository, uh, and then the endpoint, which is the Git URL. Yep. You can actually just, one thing that was really important for us is not having some hard dependency like GitHub or something like that because at Twitter and other like uh, larger companies, you tend to have these like internal kind of like registries or something going on already. <clears throat> and so everything is just pretty simply Git-based. And actually we just, I don't know if you've seen this yet, Alex, but uh, this guy's been working on a patch for uh, Bower RC file. So you can like specify alternative registries and stuff. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, it's really cool. Cool. So, what what kinds of things do you foresee adding uh, being added to this in the future? I think so. To begin with, it's like we. I think we're just focusing on kind of getting the core things going. Um, like it's only a o dot one dot whatever it is now three release, uh, and I think. I think there's a lot more kind of we can do around that. Um, and then I, gu- I guess like uh, how I've always heard it explained and I, that I've kind of liked was like first you try to solve the problem, then you like make it pretty, and then you make it like really fast. 
And I think it's already really pretty because Alex and I just wrote really nice code. But <laughs> but I think there's more problems to solve. And then I think we really need to focus on making it just a lot faster. Um, Git is really slow. We kind of made one giant improvement towards that, which is we cache all uh, Git things into like a local bat, like dot bat or thing in your home or whatever it is. Um, but I think there's a lot more we could do around speed. Alex has been talking about downloading things that are on GitHub and TARS and other, other such things. So Nice. Are there any other approaches that you could see that might work well for the front end other than a package manager that you thought about but decided not to go with? I don't know, Alex. Have you thought of anything? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. So, for example, one idea that I've had, I, I know it would be prohibitive, prohibitively expensive, but you know, maybe to provide a, a CDN where people can get the the web packages, you know, and just load them directly into their browser. Um, I think there are a couple of those already. Yeah, yeah, Google has one. Yeah. Yeah, or like CDNJS. Yeah, actually, CDNJS has a, so they host some stuff, and they have a, a tool which will actually kind of do a lot of this kind of stuff you're talking about for you. It's worth checking out. The problem with that is it's expensive, and it's like, it's something which is kind of, you have to be in the boys club to be on the CDN. And so like it doesn't really work for every project and it also doesn't work for internal things as much. Yeah. Uh, and then there's concatenation as well. Just um, like speed. If you just opening up a TCP connection is pretty expensive. And sure. so ultimately we feel people are just going to be concatenating all their files down to one big file, which they'll get shipped across. Yeah. Also like it kind of, discourages people to do smaller components, which I think is bad. Like we need to start moving towards like Alex was mentioning earlier, like people writing smaller packages and smaller JavaScript libraries. And like CDN encourages people to continue to write these huge things. That makes think, sense. Yeah, I don't think it's maybe the best solution. I think it would work in some situations, uh, but yes, yeah, I don't think in the long term it's the, the right idea probably. That's also like the ultimate dependency, like some third-party network service has to be up for your app to work. And even if it's a really big one that hopefully is better at staying up than you, that's still really scary. Yeah, for sure. So it looks like you can use Bower to manage um, CSS and HTML and, and images and stuff too. So it's for like, you could make some little widgets out of things and put them on there, right? Yeah, sure. that's, that's the idea. And... Um, what we're hoping in the, in the future, we'll have the shadow DOM, and then these components will just be like HTML tags, and all those assets will be pulled in automatically. Uh, that's yeah. the utopian future, at least. Yeah, yeah. Okay. the web, web okay. components. Okay. Back, yeah. What's the shadow DOM? Oh man, shadow DOM. Uh, this is all. There's all these really, really cool things being uh, kind of worked on over. I guess the, like some Google nerds, this guy named Dimitri, um, they're working on this spec called Web Components, and it has basically just a number of different ways for people to kind of make um, components or widgets or something in like a more standard way. And so they're giving us lots of like little cool tricks and stuff like Shadow DOM and uh, scoped styles and the ability to like import an HTML page, like include it in your page rather than like importing uh, HTML and a, I mean, rather than importing a CSS and a JavaScript and everything separately, you can just import like one HTML, like link one HTML page and stuff like that. It's real cool. Mm -hmm. There's also a Mozilla library that is being worked on by, uh, his name is escaping me right now, but um, Mozilla, if you go to the GitHub pages, they have like a, they're working on kind of a shim for it that's pretty like, Pretty cool. Is that checking out. X tag? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. X tag. Yeah, I've heard of that. Tim talked about. No, it wasn't Tim. James. James Burke talked about that a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Awesome. All right, I'll have to read up on this because I have never heard of it, and it looks pretty intense. It is really good stuff. It's like the most exciting spec I feel like in the last. So one more thing before we maybe move on to a different topic. Is there anything else? that we want to go over with Bauer, or have we pretty much covered what it's about? Um, I got one question. Okay. <clears throat> For, like, learning Bauer, what resources besides the your your page are out there right now? Is, is that pretty much it? Is just the homepage? 
Uh, yeah, you, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. All right. Um, like, there's the frankly, there's not much to Bauer. Um, like, we have that that web page on GitHub. Um, also, you have to uh, scroll it. A lot of people don't realize that you have to scroll it. <laughs> oh, I fixed um, that. Oh, you fixed that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's the instructions on there, but that's, I mean, that's basically it. Like, there, there, frankly, there isn't much to it at the moment. Yeah, there's, like, command line docs, too. Like, you can do dash dash help on basically every command, which I think is maybe even better than our... It's, like, less story and more, or, like, less plot and more, like, just the nitty-gritty of how things work. But, yeah, it's, like Alex said, it's really pretty s- simple. Um, I think that... And then again, it's super young, so I think that as time goes on, hopefully the community will start writing more, and we'll have time to write more about like how to do certain things like, that are very specific, like integrating it into a build stack or using it with sprockets or something like that. Awesome. So one last question, and that is, um, how does it work with the uh, build tools that are out there? You said you added things in that specifically make that easier I'm wondering what those are. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's two commands. They're ba- they're, ba- they're basically both under the uh, dot list command. There's like two options you can pass it. So uh, traditionally, if you use npm or a different package manager, usually if you're installing your dependencies um, and then you run whatever npm list or whatever package manager you're using, it kind of lists out the different dependencies and versions that you have installed. So we basically have just kind of extended this behavior um, with like a map and another option, which has totally escaped me. But you, yeah, yeah, you can call it uh, programmatically, and it will just, or you can actually call it from the command line, and it'll generate a JSON, so you can output a config file straight to your um, kind of repository or whatever your, your project. Uh, but yeah, it'll just it kind of lists the different. Uh, let's see, file paths and things like that that you would need if you're a build tool, or like where things live, um, the name of the projects and stuff like that, or the name of the dependencies and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to change tactics a little bit because there's another thing that I'm interested in that we really haven't uh, dug at much, and that is um, building an actual package manager. Um, sure. You know, you were talking about languages, you know, Ruby versus JavaScript or C or whatever um, for speed and things like that. Is is there a reason that you settled on Node.js other than the fact that this is a package manager for JavaScript stuff? Uh, that's the main reason, yeah. I mean, I, I think it would be crazy if we used a language other than JavaScript for a, a web package manager. Yeah, okay. this is actually largely the reason other like other projects, like Bootstrap, for example, one of the main reasons we ended up using less was because it was originally because it was written in JavaScript. Okay, cool. Um, so what what are kind of the moving parts for a package manager? I think most people are pretty familiar with like a repository of packages and then the client. Is there more to it than that? Uh, the moving parts of package management? Not really. I mean, we, we've kept it pretty simple, so it's basically just that. I mean, we if you look at the internal kind of project, you have... Um, Let's see. For a long time, we just had like a package and a manager, ob- like two different objects. But yeah, it's it's not hard. You can do it. We, I think we wrote the entire project originally in this like real crazy way, probably in a couple of weeks, like two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. We had something that was like pretty usable and not too far away from what you're seeing today. But I don't know. Yeah. And why didn't you talk about the event stuff, Jacob? That was quite interesting. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it wasn't interesting <laughs> I mean I think that it's a common I think it's a, a mildly common thing so uh, NPM was doing it or is doing it also and I think a lot of people are starting to do this which is they're uh, mixing in events or extending uh, e- emitter or whatever when they're working on uh, these things um, so the API that you kind of end up with is very it's like all event driven, and it's kind of nice to work with, at least I think, from like a consumable way. So you get data events, error events, and an end event, um, and these are all past like information that's useful. So you would say, for example, uh, Bower dot commands dot install, and then you would listen to uh, the number of events you get back, which are all just regular kind of events you'd expect, um, rather than having like the function function everywhere, uh, like callback nested callback. Blah, blah, blah. Right. 
Are there any challenges that you ran into that were kind of a pain to work around? Hmm. I think, uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's always like real, some real weird things. Uh, let's see. I think originally kind of getting, figuring out how to do or how we wanted to do the, uh, resolving of dependencies with versioning was pretty tricky. Um, a lot of our problems also came from the fact that we were relying on Git, which I still think is the right decision. But it was like tricky, like, okay, how should we do versioning? Oh, okay, we'll use Git. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, do you, just do, do you just tag versions with semantic version numbers? Yep, exactly. So okay. we found a lot of people in the community were already doing it, uh, and we thought that it was a good convention and something that we'd like people to continue to do, <laughs> kind of. Um, and it does get a little tricky. So, like, for example, not everyone's really, like, super crazy about uh, semantic versioning, for example, very specifically. Um, and so you get people, like, I'll pick on Ember, for example. They're using something that's, like, almost there. I wish Yehuda was here, so I'll just, like, call him out. Uh, <laughs> like, they're doing, like, they have some release, which is, like, one uh, this is totally wrong, but 1.2.1, and then they're trying to specify like a beta release, and so they did like 1.2.1. beta. 6, but really you're supposed to do 1.2.1. dash beta. 6, and so it's like not semver, so it fails as a version, which is kind of like sucky, but also they're just not version incorrect. So I don't know. <laughs> so are you enforcing semver then? What? Are yeah, you enforcing yeah. semantic versioning then? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we we. I've worked really closely with uh, Isaac on a lot of this stuff. I feel like he's done just an amazing job with NPM and has like tons and tons of like information to share about it. And so like he's been for sure like a real serious advisor and been like completely amazing. Um, and we're sharing a lot of components. And we're also like as this project evolves, we need to start bre- breaking out stuff because he's also kind of expressed interest in like consuming some of our um, things we worked on. Uh, like we did this templating thing that I think is pretty cool um, that I haven't seen a lot of command line tools do. That a bit, Originally, I think Rod Begg kind of paved the way with it, but we, we're using Mustache for all our command line in, uh, output, or actually Hogan.js, um, and so, which is pretty cool, and we have this like kind of interesting color mix-in system thing we're using for colored output. It's pretty cool. Awesome. It, That's kind of sweet. I never have thought about using templates for command line stuff, but it makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, it's really great, particularly because of like white space is so like important and yeah. mustache, like the spec around white space is so strict that like you it turns out really awesome and it's really extra readable and you don't have those like if you look at the NPM source for example, it's like really intense string concatenation all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's a real cool kind of way. I think I think that's the one advantage is like getting more front end nerds like up into command line tools is you get to see them like doing weird stuff like that in a good way. So can I ask like a wildly off topic question? No. <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems like so package management is one of these like wild west areas that there's lots of stuff going on in, in JavaScript and this is kind of your solution to try and fix it. What do you think the next like big problem that people are going to look at is going to be in, in front-end JavaScript stuff? Oh, that's a good question. I think I would follow Alex on Twitter, because um, he did <laughs> thing, and, like, that was a real that was like a real big thing that everyone was building. Now he's on this package manager thing, which is a lot of people are doing, so I would just follow him. Something crazy. I think there's a lot of, me personally, I think there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of crazy stuff around mobile web application development. So I was talking to people the other day, like uh, Facebook, like their mobile web app uh, has more like users than both their Android and iPhone thing combined. We have like a similar, we had a similar thing in Twitter. And so like there's, I think, I don't know, I've heard some rumors of like different big players working on different kind of mobile web UI things so i think something around that will come out but i don't know if it'll be as like intensely intense as the package manager thing is so i'm not, I'm not really sure i don't know follow yeah. alex alex i've i've got um one um the google apps the google chrome apps so now 
actually, actually it's not well known, but uh, as part of Google Chrome, you can now create like a desktop app. We're all written in JavaScript and HTML, and behind the scenes, it uses Chrome, but none of your users need to know that. And because you're running on a desktop, you can just go crazy with the effects and the graphics, and uh, the, the apps look completely native. Uh, and so this is something that I've been working on with a few Googlers, and I've been working on this framework to create really native-looking UIs, um, but in JavaScript and HTML. That's sweet. Yep, there you have it. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> now we don't, don't need to my... follow him on Twitter. Yes. Don't tell, don't tell <laughs> I know, my I that basically just saved you there, Nina. So. <laughs> <laughs> you those weird tweets. <laughs> what were we going to say, uh, Joe? I was going to say, don't tell Microsoft that you're building desktop apps in JavaScript. <laughs> it's true. Why? What will happen? Oh, that's their big Windows 8 thing. You can build desktop apps in JavaScript. <laughs> I thought that was more like little widgety things, though. Yeah, widgets, apps, whatever. Yeah. I, so. I actually really like the idea of desktop apps. Like, I, uh, I started a little tool for it and then got sidetracked. But the idea of deploy something with Node onto somebody's computer and then run it in the browser, well, I think that's a desktop app still, but have access to all of the, you know, like, stuff. Yeah, so with uh, Chrome, actually, um, they give you a UDP access, they give you access to the USB hardware, like, you don't even need to actually run anything else. Um, and they package it up for you, and they'll do, like, one-click installs through the Chrome Store. And they've basically put, like, the Chrome Store on all their platforms. Um, so, like, uh, it's, it, like, they've basically snuck an OS onto basically every platform. Like, it's incredible. Right. This is through Chrome? Uh, yeah, this is through Chrome, basically. So once you're running desktop apps in JavaScript, what is the advantage of doing that over writing a desktop app in like a traditional desktop app language? Is it just because you get to use all the cool front-end stuff that you already know about if you're like a front-end developer who's moving into desktop stuff? Uh, yeah, that and, and just speed, uh, speed of development and like uh, CSS, is, I think, is just incredible. Like, um, you'll find that a lot of iOS, native iOS apps, actually just use PNGs. Like, they just cut up PNGs. It's like the old days of the web. Um, but huh. it's, it's really hard to get, um, you know, get, get those graphics working. Um, and with just HTML and CSS, it's just so simple. Right. So, are there any other aspects of uh, or, or problems that you've solved with this that you want to talk about before we get into the picks? Oh, I think uh, I think I've said all I can. So, is the only candidate or the only difference between candidates for npm versus uh, Bower whether you're going to use them on your website versus on uh, Node? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. Well, let's go ahead and get into the picks. Do we'll make AJ go first? Oh, good. All right. So, recently, no, not recently, over the past since I was 13, uh, I was 13 years ago, um, my pocket knife has, you know, gotten duller, even though it's been sharpened several times, and while it's losing metal, and the spring in it doesn't really work that well anymore. You know, Is this a metaphor enough. for old age? No. no. <laughs> I wasn't intending it that way. So anyway, so I got this, one of my coworkers has this Kershaw knife, it's actually the leak, and it's a three-inch knife. And so I was looking on Amazon, and I picked out this one that was very similar, except it had a, a blade that I liked more, because it's got a nice angle to it, and better for ripping open plastic packages when you're ordering from Amazon Prime on time, you know? Um, but it turns out that it's, it's a three-and-a-half-inch knife, and it's quite a bit bigger than what I was expecting, but it's way awesome. Uh, great for cutting bagels, for opening Amazon packages, um, uh, maybe stabbing someone in a defense situation. Uh, <laughs> going through the airport with, I get where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, can't do that with it. Actually, it's really weird because sometimes it's just bigger than a knife that I've normally carried. It's not big enough to be considered a weapon because it's actually slightly under three and a half. And for most states, three and a half, if it's bigger than three and a half, that's where it becomes questionable or, you know, it, it, it could be considered a weapon. Um, and then a few states that are very strict 
will go as low as two and a half. But for definitely Utah, I mean, Utah is a very conservative state, so you know they believe in your rights to their tools, such as anyway. Uh, so I put a link to it. It's the it's the Kershaw Onion Tactical Blur, um, and it's it's been great. I'm also looking at getting a Leatherman Wave because it has all the tools that I missed from my Swiss Army knife. But the Wave is kind of heavy, so not sure about that yet. All right, any other picks? No, but I do want to say sorry that I was like off for most of the show, and when I went on, I didn't feel like speaking because I'd missed too much. Uh, that's okay. We'll forgive you. Sounded really good. We still love you. Yeah. All right, Jameson, what are your picks? Okay, my first pick is the new XX album, Coexist. It's really good. Uh, it's just good, like, chill, I don't know, popish music. I don't know how to describe it, but it's it's a great listen. Oh, looks like a yoink dude from Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was going to pick this, like, computer science thingy that made me sound really smart, but I didn't actually read it, so I don't get to pick it. <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, hopefully I'll read it and then get to pick it. So Wait, that's never stopped me before. <laughs> <laughs> My secrets, they're out. Uh, Neil Armstrong's, um, he died a while ago, and somebody in the Atlantic wrote up his uh, funeral, and it's amazing. Like, it's just great writing and uh, made me cut some onions. That's my other pick, Neil Armstrong's uh, funeral. Uh, eulogy write up thing in the Atlantic and then my last pick is uh, the thing that has made me laugh until I cried probably I don't think that's ever happened to me before it's a YouTube Yay. video called Collective Soul Cat and it's beautiful <laughs> nice. nice okay wow. uh, can you make sure you get links to those in the show notes Jameson Collective Soul Cat is probably the most important one of those so okay Joe what are your picks all right, um, so my first pick, I'm going to re-pick something you picked uh, previously, Chuck, Amazon Prime, because I found out just recently that the original Star Trek series is on Amazon Prime, nice. which is totally awesome. Yep. So um, for my second pick, I want to pick this uh, Coursera. Uh, they just uh, launched a Scala class. It's a seven-week-long Scala class and is really cool. So I'm going to pick that as well. For anybody who wants to learn functional programming, Scala is completely awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, for my last pick, I'm going to pick Domo, the company that I'm working for right now. Just been really enjoying things, mostly because today is cake day at Domo. Let they them eat a- cake. Yep. <laughs> they brought in a whole bunch of cake and these really crafty, like super awesome um, cupcakes. And so since it's cake day at Domo, I'm going to pick Domo. We're actually hiring for front web developers here in Utah. So if you either live in Utah or want to move to Utah and you're a front end web developer, uh, give us a contact. Awesome. Hey, I got a plug because everybody's always talking about how they're hiring. We're hiring too. We're looking for web devs and uh, edit devs. And basically, if you're smart and learn things, come talk to us. Someone, right. someone in IT. Hello, IT. What was that? Uh, so it's probably too far away from Mike. My, my coworker, he says, "We want someone in IT." Hello, IT. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll go ahead and do my picks next. Um, my first pick is uh, it's actually a feature of uh, Google's Gmail or Google Apps Mail. Um, I found out that there's a feature in there where you can actually delegate. Um, access to your inbox to someone else. And uh, since I've uh, switched VAs, um, my VA, I actually gave her access to my inbox and I was sitting there trying to figure out how I could, you know, because if, if I sign in and then she signs in from where she's at, it says, um, well, you're one person, so obviously you can't be in Utah and Pennsylvania at the same time. And so it'll kick the kick one of you out. And so I've been trying to figure out how to give her access. And it turns out that if you're in Google Apps, if you go into your settings for your domain and you just check the box that says that you can delegate to somebody else on your domain, all of a sudden you can say, hey, give this person access to this inbox. And uh, so it's really nice. And then she can go in and pull the emails that she needs out of there, forward them to her account, and then 
work from there. So, for example, I've had transcripts for several of my shows done, and they never got put up, and so she was able to go in and find those and put them into uh, a system that... Um, or forward them to herself so that she could then go through them and put them onto the shows that they've been done for. So, um, and, and I guess that's also a way of saying, keep an eye out because, um, there will be transcripts coming down the pike for, um, all of these shows. Anyway, uh, my other pick is something that I've been wasting an inordinate amount of time with, and that is civilization four. Um, I found it in the Mac, Mac app store and, uh, it's just, it's, it's a fun game. And so, at first I wasn't quite sure about it, but I've kind of gotten to like it. It's a turn-based game. It's sort of like um, Risk or StarCraft or something like that, a general mix of that. I'm not sure exactly how to describe it, but anyway, I've been enjoying it. It's like 10 or 20 bucks on the App Store. And finally, um, my last pick is I bought this. It's a Fujitsu Scan Snap. It's a scanner. It just sits on my desk. It's this teeny thing that just feeds paper through it. It's small enough that I can put it in my laptop bag when I travel and take it with me and scan my receipts there. And it has all these functions. So you can scan something and then you can say, okay, I want this in Evernote and Dropbox and a PDF. And um, there are like a dozen options that it gives you every time you scan. And you just click the little icons for all the ones you want. And so for me, I just put them into Dropbox. And then once I have them in Dropbox, I just sort them into the appropriate uh, basket. And then I'm done. So um, it's it's been really nice. I've been really, really enjoying having it because um, it also has a program that comes with it for um, business cards. And so that you just feed the business card through. And the cool thing is, is that it then feeds it into a program that will read the business card. And you can actually export um, the little contact file things that you can import into Google. So then I just import all my contacts into the Google and I'm done into Google Contacts. So anyway, um, really, really enjoying those, and I'll put links to those in the show notes. Um, let's let Jacob give us his picks. Oh, right. Um, let's see. Something that I got also emotional about uh, was one of my favorite Twitter accounts, Bill Nye, though, got suspended, <laughs> which is real no. sad. Don't you work what? at Google? Can't you unsuspend Bill Nye? Uh, I don't. I'm unemployed now. I quit. Oh. Yeah. So, so you're still doing Bauer or Bower even though you're not at Twitter anymore? Yeah, yeah. yeah. At Bootstrap, yeah. I'm still running basically all their open source projects out of <laughs> out of love for the open source. Well, well we, we, we appreciate it. Um, so there's that. Bill Nye, though. Great injustice. Real sad about it. Um... Let's see. Oh, have you guys seen the new GitHub profile redesigns and the new GitHub design stuff? That's really I cool. I just saw like the frothing rage that people had about it and was confused. Uh, I like it. I'm like on the other side. I, I think there's like a few things that would be nice. Like they buried members and organizations and a few little things. Uh, but I'm I'm into it. It's cool. I like it. I think it just depends on how much you use the features that they buried. Um, for example, I was having a little bit of trouble because I had to go hunt for the organization so I could switch to the one I wanted. Mm. But um, other than That's that, fair. other than that, I mean, most of the stuff's like pretty. no big deal. Yeah, it, it might does not look be better, usable, but it looks real pretty. <laughs> yeah. Well, people complain it. when Facebook My changes their. Bigger. That's cool. <laughs> Every time Facebook changes their layout, people complain. So why should GitHub be any different? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now I can finally relate to my grandpa. (laughs) Yeah. Twitter also changed their profile. That's kind of dope looking. I like it. You can have like a second background kind of header thing. It's cool. Nice. Mm, That's about it. I had some uh, hot dog flavored chips from 7-Eleven yesterday that were not good. That's my (laughs) last pick. (laughs) Avoid at all costs. (laughs) I was going to say, what part of hot dog flavored chips makes you want to buy them i was talking to this uh this is the problem i was talking to this oakland girl and those kids are on like oakland javascript is a whole thing but the they've the east bay you've just got to watch those kids because they they'll just i don't know suck you in with the hot dog flavored chip recommendation and you'll be enticed and it's real bad so avoid 
So you did it for a girl, enough said. All right, Alex, what are your picks? Okay, so my first pick is a, a blog called The Big Picture, which is actually run by a programmer at uh, the Boston. Um, so it's boston.com slash big picture. And this guy just receives all of these um, photos over the wire from Reuters and all these other reporters and uh, basically puts them into, has a theme, has a few themes a week of all these incredible photos. Um, and so, I, like, I check that out uh, every other day. That's amazing. Uh, my, my second um, uh, pick is CoffeeScript Redux. Now, this is a rewrite of CoffeeScript to use PEG.js. Uh, and now, PEG parsing expression grammars are just awesome. You can describe um, a whole language in, um, I don't know, a 500-line file. Um, it's incredible. Uh, and so uh, this guy, Michael, has rewritten CoffeeScript um, to use PEG.js, um, and it's, it's much more easy to understand than the source code now. But also, there are, he's added source map uh, support. And source maps are awesome um, because they basically uh, mean you don't have to go through compiled JavaScript in uh, the browser when you're debugging it and that sort of thing. Um, and my last pick uh, would be Stripe. Uh, we have just launched in Canada. <laughs> and, oh, can, uh, my, can one of my picks be just everyone quit your job? It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to do a bit of self-promotion there. We, um, we just launched in Canada. We're going to be launching um, in the rest of the world soon, hopefully. Um, and, uh, and we're just an awesome service for doing payments online. Yeah, lots of love for Stripe, definitely. Okay, um, well, that's all of our picks. Uh, next week, I believe we have somebody scheduled. Let me pull up my calendar here real quick going to be noel rep and he is the author of time and space in javascript or something like that a uh, good friend of mine and uh probably going to learn a lot about uh learning and teaching javascript is what he's going to talk to us about so um anyway uh beyond that i just want to thank you guys for coming oh, alex no and thank you so jacob much. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. yeah really appreciate it and uh looking forward to what what bauer has to offer and uh yeah, we'll catch everybody next week. Thanks for listening.